officially good morning welcome thank you for joining us this morning my name is hannah beard and i am the marketing and merchant engagement manager with downtown inc so this month's bloom business series webinar and like i said packed with lots of good information for our audience today and we're learning about certification and procurement opportunities for your small business so today's event is made possible by our presenting sponsor, PNC. Once again, thank you, PNC, for your ongoing support for our 2022 Bloom Business Series workshops. With us today are Robert Brown and Mark Rhodes. I'm going to introduce you to Robert now, and we'll hear from Mark later in the program. Robert Brown has been the program director of the SEDA Council of Governments P Procurement Technical Assistance Center, PTAC since 2005. The PTAC program assists small businesses in obtaining local, state, and federal government contracts. Mr. Brown has 20 years experience in private industry in the areas of commercial purchasing, accounting, sales, and management. His industry experience includes retail sales, construction, and manufacturing. He's currently a certified associate contracting assistance specialist with the Association of Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. Robert is also a Veterans Administration Certification Counselor through the Office of Small Business Disadvantaged Businesses, or I'm sorry, Disadvantaged Business. Robert obtained his MBA from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania in 1996. I'm now gonna turn it over to you, Robert. If anybody has questions in our audience today for either of today's speaker, please drop them in the Q&A or chat feature at Anytime, you can find that feature along the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the program, when we do the Q&A, we'll address those questions. So, Mr. Brown, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Right. Hannah, thank you very much. And thank you to you, uh, Hannah and, and Sully, for uh, inviting uh, me to participate in this event. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, I want to just uh, throw it out here that we're going to get, I'm going to give you a, a 10,000 foot view of government contracting as we're going through this and uh, touch on the certification process. Um, if you want to go next slide, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center was funded, uh, is funded by Department of Defense. And we do have an association we belong to. We have 94 centers throughout the country. We assist the small business primarily. I'm not going to read slides to you, but we basically will assist you in the area of government contracting, local, state, and federal government contracting, trying to help you understand how to navigate through that maze of government contracts that a lot of you are probably looking at going, how, how do you get started on this? Um, if you want to go next, some of the things that we really try to do, I like to give you results, uh, some of the results we've had of you know, some smaller companies, some larger companies, helping them identify and find a procurement uh, opportunity they can respond to. And, um, you know, trying to help them put the bid package together if necessary, if, if there's enough time left in the process. Uh, when you first find an open bid, uh, you know, we can um, help you understand what are the requirements, you know, what are the things you need to look at. And some of the results we've had here, uh, company TD Mills uh, in the, um, Hershey area, they basically are uh, supporting Defense uh, Department of Defense, the DLA uh, distribution center in uh, New Cumberland. So, uh, you know, in their case, they needed help uh, understanding how to complete a bid package and understanding how to get paid from the government. If you uh, if you're going to bid on a government contract, that's my first question. If I'm a business person, how am I getting paid and what do I have to do to get paid? Some of the other larger companies are mass machine in Lycoming County. We identified a bid opportunity for them to provide metalworking machine uh, to uh, Norfolk, uh, NAFS up in Norfolk. So just some ideas there. If you want to go next, the uh, government, federal government arena uh, is about a $630 billion federal procurement market. So it's gigantic. By far and away, the largest one, uh, largest federal agency is Department of Defense. As you might imagine, they do the most federal procurement spending. But with it being 637 billion, there's a lot of agencies that you can look at, uh, not just Department of Defense. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out on here, you know, the federal acquisition regulation is very important. Uh, it's the uh, the uh, regulations that govern uh, federal procurement. You need to really understand it. 
Um, I would really highly recommend Small Business Programs Part 19 that really explains in detail some of the things I'm going to touch on today. It's also important to understand there's different kinds of contracts. Firm fixed price is primarily what a lot of our clients are dealing with. And uh, you need to understand that there are different types of contracts. Federal supply schedules is the GSA contract that many of you probably have heard of. You need to have a discussion with, with myself and my staff before you uh, look into going into a federal supply schedule or responding to a bet, an opportunity to, to obtain a federal supply schedule. There's a lot you need to know about that. That's a separate hour and a half, two hour meeting for us to discuss all the details of that. Um, if you aren't set up to accept credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, federal government does about 20 billion a year, 21 billion a year in federal procurement through the credit card. They raised the limit a couple of years ago to $10,000. That's called the micro purchase threshold. So the government, the state government also can buy up to $10,000. They don't necessarily have to post a bid anywhere for that. That's called a micro purchase. And a lot of our small businesses support the government, federal and state government with credit card purchases, supplying products and, and services too to the government. Next. Uh, I want to make sure you understand you got to have a, a strategy um, and, you know, hopefully we can help you come up with a strategy to sell to the government. The federal government releases opportunities on a website called SAM.gov um, and, and the sources sought notice is something that's the beginning of the federal procurement process. So you really have to understand how to look for sources sought notices and understand what is the government looking for. A source of thought is basically an announcement saying that, you know, it's, I look at it as they're, they're fishing for contractors and they're fishing for somebody who can solve a problem. So they're throwing that opportunity up on SAM.gov saying, hey, who's interested in this? It's not necessarily a bid. It's just they're, they're doing market research, trying to see who might respond to that opportunity in the future. So the source of thought notice is very important putting a strategy together to understand, you know, are you going to just bid on government contracts as a prime? Are you going to identify large businesses that you, you know, that you could be a supplier for? A lot of our small businesses get started that way. So you got to really look at your strategy. Next, please. Uh, did you know that the um, <clears throat> large business prime contractors is a big, is a giant viable market for you as a small business? They have a contact, contact called a small business liaison officer. If you wanted to see what government contracts are posted or awarded, you can go to that first link there, fpds.gov. And also you can look at USA Spending. They basically, that's the check register for the federal government where they post bid opportunity or contract awards. So you can actually go out and see what contracts have been awarded, what agencies you can, um, you go to that fpds.gov, it's called an easy search. It just, it's, and that's exactly what it is. You can type a keyword in and hit enter and see all the contracts that have been awarded in your particular area. A lot of our businesses will use um, uh, the NAICS code, a, a North American Industrial Classification System code that's specific to your industry. If you're a machine shop, uh, that code's 332710. You type it into the easy search on the federal procurement data system, hit enter, and you'll see all the contracts, and you'll see the top 10 contractors that are getting the work in that area. They happen to be large businesses. You can try to understand how to do business with that large business because you might be able to supply them uh, some parts, you know, for the projects that they're responding to. Lobar is a good example. They're a construction company in the area, Dillsburg area. Uh, they have a small business link on their website. If you wanted to be a supplier or a vendor for Lobar, you can go out to their link and they will. They have a small business link out there with a process that you have to follow to try to become a supplier for them. Next, please. A small business specialist is somebody who works for the federal government. They're, they're kind of like the SBLO, but these folks work for the federal agencies. They're kind of like what I, what I do, but they're specific to the agency. So we can help you identify who the small business specialists are in the area. If you're trying to do business with like a Toby Hanna Army Depot or Letterkenny, somebody like that, there's a point of contact you should be talking to to understand, you know, how you do business with that particular federal government agency, whether it's an army base, navy base, whatever, they all have differences in how they do business. And it depends on what you offer 
product or service, you know, whether they need your product or service, uh, uh, you know, you got, they can help you try to understand that too. Next, please. And uh, what's a small business for federal contracting? Generally speaking, well, you've got to be for profit. Um, they look at your number of employees and your three-year average annual receipts of your business. Uh, if you're in the manufacturing arena, generally speaking, um, you want to go out to this SBA gov uh, size table and look up the six-digit NAICS code that applies to your business. And in the far right column, it'll list either a number of employees or a dollar value. Uh, if you're if you're a manufacturer, let's say you're a machine shop, and you go type in three three two seven ten in that database, it's going to take you to machine shop, and then you look in the far right column, it's going to have a number five hundred. That means if you're less than five hundred employees, including all affiliates, you're going to be determined to be a small business for that particular NAICS code. And if there's any bids that come out with that NAICS code associated with it, you got to be below five hundred. Uh, in terms of number of employees to be a small business for that particular procurement. It is possible to be small for some NAICS codes and large for others. I have companies that, you know, that are in both categories, but you always got to look up what is the NAICS code that's associated with that bid package and understand where you fall. So um, if you go to the next slide, some general guidelines. These are just general guidelines. If you're in heavy uh, construction, your three-year average annual receipts can't uh, be greater than 39.5 million. 500 employees is usually the cutoff for wholesale trade and also for uh, manufacturing. Next. Um, what you also need to have a look at is the, remember I said FAR Part 19 has all the small business programs in, in it. <clears throat> These are just, I'm just giving you a general, this is, this is some of the things that you need to look at. As you all know, the federal government has a goal, small business goal, they're trying to meet 23%. And they're making a good faith effort to provide maximum practicable opportunity to small businesses. That does not mean they're required to give you a contract. So I like to make sure people know that. You have to have what they want and you have to be able to deliver it when they want it. And you know, the certifications will help you with that, but certifications are not the only thing that they look at. They look at, you know, do you got what I want? I mean, it's no different than the commercial market in that regard. And you have to successfully sell yourself to the federal government um, or respond in a bid package with a good price. Um, if it's a request for proposal, they look at other factors to make a contract award. You know, for example, your technical, um, capabilities, they might look at your, they'll look at your past performance and price will be one, one factor also in a request for a proposal. If it's a request for quote, they're going to want the lowest price, period. Generally, you know, that's usually how it's working. Um, the 8A business development uh, program, if you're um, African, Black African American, Hispanic American, Native American, Asian Pacific or subcontinent Asian American, you fall into the group to be socially and economically disadvantaged. Your net worth can't exceed 750,000. Uh, you get deductions for that, uh, your uh, value of your home, the value of your business and any money in a, in a uh, permanent retirement account. If you fo flow below, fall below that 750 and you're in one of those designated groups, you can apply for the 8A program. The 8A program is a nine year program. So once you get certified, you got nine years and then you will graduate from that program. So I don't recommend you jump right out there and get the 8A certification right away. I recommend generally, uh, if you can qualify for that program, you got to get some contacts and do some networking and start bidding on some contracts uh, because you don't want to waste any of that nine years of that program. So you want to use that. There's other certifications that you can obtain that we'll talk about here. Hub zone historically uh, utilized business zone is based on where your business, your primary business is located. Uh, it, it tends to be areas that are uh, downtown, like downtown York is a hub zone, downtown Harrisburg. Areas in and around colleges and universities fall into the category of the hub zone program. 35% of your employees have to reside in a hub zone, not necessarily the same one. Um, if you're a veteran or service disabled veteran, they also look at ownership as being 51% or greater. So you, you got to have the majority ownership of the business for any of these programs. If you're woman owned, same thing. 
uh, 51% ownership or greater. Um, I'll explain to you if you're a woman owned business, you know, you can self certify through the SBA uh, in their program online, but we also have um, a, a certification you can obtain called the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. And I'm going to just kind of touch on that here a little bit. But if you want to go next, please. <clears throat> uh, vendor registrations, I have about seven minutes here, so I want to keep moving. Um, Federal government, SAM.gov is where you want to go to register. You have to create an account. Um, do not register on uscontractorregistration.com. They will charge you $600. Myself and my staff will help you for free. And so will anybody else that works for a procurement technical assistance center in the United States of those 94 centers. Do not pay $600. And when it comes time to renew it, you have to re renew it yearly. Don't pay anybody. Call us. We will help you. We will do it for you if we have to. We do that. Um, and I will not charge you for it. Um, dynamic small business search is, I consider it the yellow pages of federal contracting. The SBA has that website. It's fabulous. Uh, you want to create uh, you know, your, your entity in SAM.gov, but you also create a profile in the SBA profile, also called a dynamic small business search. They, it's the same thing. But it's, it's a free yellow page listing where you get to say, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's some of my past performance. It's a, it's a great way to kind of, uh, you know, mar market yourself. Federal buyers and, and program managers a lot of times will search the SBA dynamic small business search for people that they can possibly work with. So it is important to be on there. Uh, if you are a veteran. The veterans first program through the VA is uh, you get verified through the VA. We can help you with that. So next, please. Registration number one, what you really want to do, they, they now use something called a unique uh, entity identification. The government used to use a Dun & Bradstreet number that has gone away. They now assign a separate number called a UEI. Do you want to go next? The UEI, again, I'm telling you, <laughs> get a hold of us to help you with this process. It can be a little cumbersome because of all the changes they've gone through back in May. Um, whether you need to update it or whether you're registering as new, I would suggest getting a hold of us. Um, if, you don't, if, you're, if we don't cover the county that you're located in, we will put you in touch with the correct PTAC center so that you can get this done. You've gotta be in SAM because um, number one, it's how you get paid by the government. So you wanna be in there. Also, many of the open bids will tell you, you have to be registered in SAM to be considered for contract awards. So you definitely need to do it. It's also where you self-certify as a small business. So it's very important to be in there. Next, number two, go ahead, next. Registration number two, um, this is still actually kind of <laughs> number one, but uh, SAM.gov is not a guarantee of a contract. Uh, it is basically how you get paid. Next, please. Uh, what do you need to register in SAM? I won't go through all this, but those are the items that you're going to need to round up or to gather to complete the SAM registration. The other thing I can do, if you really want to do this yourself, we can do we can set it up so that um, we can do a virtual meeting and we can walk you through it virtually. Or if you want us to do it for you, <coughs> the information on this slide is what we're going to need from you to, to, to do it. Um, you also must submit a notarized letter the first time you register. That's basically designating a person in your in your uh, business as the entity administrator. So, and that's very specific in that letter what they need on that template. Um, I'd recommend you know we review your letter for you before you send it in because they get very particular about what they want on that letter, and sometimes it's just one word that's not correct on there. Uh, your 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 legal business name has to be exactly correct. Your legal address, all that stuff has to be exactly correct. And there's other requirements on that letter. So let us have a look at it for you before you send it in or let us help you with this process. Next, please. This is what the website looks like, SAM.gov. If you were going to register as new, you'd go out to this website, SAM.gov and click on get started. Next, please. And next, please. And when you get in and begin the registration process and get through it, <clears throat> you're gonna see, you remember how I talked about the dynamic small business search? It's also called the SBA uh, profile. Well, when you get about three quarters of the way through SAM, you're gonna see this screen pop up and you click on that gray box, register or update your SBA profile. 
This is the one that I said is the yellow pages of federal contracting. So you want to be sure you go in there and complete that, that information so that you show up in a search if the government is looking for somebody that provides your products or services. Next, please. And this is when you do enter and click on that box, you'll see mandatory data on the left is highlighted in yellow. That's what you want to click on to go in and complete the process. Go next, please. This slide will basically show you if I, let's pretend I'm a contracting officer or I'm an end user with the government and I'm trying to find small businesses in Clinton County, I can do a search in this database. And if you have completed your information, like the, comp the second company down, Marshall Group has completed their capabilities narrative, which is just basically a paragraph or two that explains what you do. <clears throat> that, that demonstrates that you've done your research and your homework and you're in here. Uh, the company above them, LTT Trucking, they didn't complete the NAIC capabilities narrative. They probably didn't understand that they needed to go in and complete the SBA profile. Therefore, there, there's nothing showing in there for them. If I'm an end user or contracting officer, I might just go on to the next company. I might not even look at LTT Trucking. So you want to make sure it's done correctly. Next, please. Registration, another one. If you happen to be a veteran, um, you know, uh, next, please go to VetBiz. Uh, that website is very important to register in there to get, uh, and thank you to all the veterans for your service. Uh, you can complete the Vet VA uh, certification or verification online. You also self-certify in the SAM database. If you're a veteran or service disabled veteran, you would want to do that. The VA Veterans First Contracting Program is basically, it's out there um, for you to get verified and it helps you get VA contracts, but you can also use that as a third party certification for the state. So I'll show you that as we go forward. Next, please. And these are just some websites that you need to check out. SAM.gov is the one that I said you have to register on. Some other ones here that you, know, you should just at least go out and look at, take a look at them. SBA subnet at the bottom, that's a very good website too. That is basically where large businesses post contracting open contracts or opportunities. So if you're a small business, you could you could go you could respond you could respond to. Uh, sorry about the cat. <laughs> he won't be quiet. I should have put him in the basement. <laughs> Anyhow, um, the SBA subnet database is basically where large businesses post bid opportunities that you could respond to. It'll tell you, hey send us XYZ information if you're interested. So it's a very good uh, opportunity. Next, please. <laughs> and let's pretend now, let's turn off the federal contracting hat and put on the state contracting hat. Go next, please. And if you happen to be a small business for state contracting, your, your revenue can exceed 38.5 million, including all affiliates, uh, and you can't exceed 100 employees. Still got to be for profit, but you can register. If you go next, you would first register as a vendor. They have a separate database called the PA Supplier Portal. Um, I'd recommend you use Chrome or Edge when you do this registration to save yourself some headaches. Um, and once you get registered as a, as a supplier, if you're under those thresholds for small business, you can also self-certify as a small business. If you go next, please. <clears throat> next, please. Uh, this is where you begin the process to on, on the database called PRISM to self-certify as a small business. Or if you happen to be woman, veteran, minority, LGBTQ, or if you have a permanent disability, you can also self-certify, uh, get a third-party certification and get a small diverse status with the Commonwealth of PA, and that will help you. Next, please. This is where you go to start the application to self-certify as a small business or if you have a third party certification, you know, uh, to certify as a small diverse business with the Commonwealth. Next, please. I'm going over here. Uh, these are the third party certifications I mentioned. The unified certification, if you're going to do PennDOT work, that's a good one. It's free. Women's Business Enterprise National Council is the one for woman owned. They do have a yearly fee of about $300 for that one. Or you can self certify on the SBA website. As a, as a woman owned business, uh, you don't have to have the third party certification, but I think it's a good idea to get it because you can use it for federal contracting and state contracting. 
So I think it's a very good idea to do that. And then the other uh, certifications below, if you obtain one of those third party certifications and go out to the state website, you can self, um, you can obtain the small diverse status uh, for the fed for state contracting. Next, please. And those will just go by those. Um, next, please. Um, the state has a program called CoStars. If you wanted to bid on contract, uh, get a contract for the state, uh, this allows you to sell to local government, program, um, colleges and universities, uh, boroughs, townships. These are just some of the areas that you could respond to. Uh, once you obtain a contract, uh, then you can go out and market to those entities. So I just wanted you to see some of the areas like uh, janitorial supplies, uh, toiletries, graphic printing. It's not all just products, it's services also. Next, please. Some additional CoStars contracts that are open. You can see uh, laboratory supplies, medical supplies is a big area. Next, please. And you can see some additional CoStars bid opportunities that are always open, open all the time you can respond to. Their process is pretty straightforward. It's an online process, but we can help you with it. Next, please. And that's um, the last section of CoStars next. And then finally, if you need to get in touch with your local procurement technical assistance center, the Association of Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, which we belong to, you can go out, click on that link, go to the map of the United States, find the PTAC program that's closest to you, and if you're in York County, it's going to be CETACOG. It's going to be myself and my staff. Next, please. We're here to serve you. Uh, you pay your tax dollars, you know, and we're out here to help you with this uh, line of work. Myself, Denise Fees, and Heather Vile, we're out here to help you. So get in touch with us. If you want to register and become a client of our program, you click on that bottom link, CETA-COG.org, PTAC. Fill out the online client enrollment form and we will begin to help you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Robert. So next we're gonna hear from a local small business owner about their experience obtaining a certification, what that process was like and how it has affected their business. So I'm happy to introduce you to Mark Rhodes, president of Key Learning Consultants. Mark is a diversity educator and strategist, conducts diversity culture audits and leads analysis and conflict resolution in intergroup communications workshops. He works with each client to better understand their strategies and action plans and facilitates diversity, sexual harassment prevention, and multicultural customer service to its employees, customers, and other constituencies for a more productive and profitable future. Mark is also consulted with Fortune 500 corporations, government agencies, and non-for-profit organizations in the US and has spoken at several conferences and universities. Mark has trained employees from senior executive suites to the factory floor. Mark has also been a commissioner with the City of York Human Relations Commission for the past seven years. He's also the owner of Mark and Val's Wines, a, an urban winery, and one of the first black owned businesses in Pennsylvania, which you can find at Penn Market. And what is this I have here, Mark? Is this my very own? I'm trying to make it's it a not blurry. gorgeous bottle of wine you got there. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make it not blurry, but yes, I have my very own <laughs> bottle of Mark and Biles wine. I had to bring that out. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And then you can go ahead and give your presentation and reminder for questions, drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Thanks. And Bob, so good to see you. His, I'm going to tell you right now, CETACOG is a godsend if you want to get into federal contracts and all those things. Because I first met Bob, I called CETACOG, and um, he asked me a few questions. I gave him some answers. And he said, well, how about I come down and meet you? And I went... Really? Okay, come on down. And we met at Panera's. Do you remember that, Bob? We met at Panera's Bread. And he and I sat and talked for about an hour, hour and a half, maybe it was. It was a while. I know we just relaxed and talked. And I got to learn a lot about government contracting. You know, was I ready for that? You know, that was really the big thing. Was I ready to take on a big government contract? Where was I 
where did I stand and what was the processes and all those things. And his office was great. I met, um, I don't, I see she's no longer on your list. Kristen Moyer. Yeah. Did Kristen Lee, she retired? <laughs> oh no, she still works for the agency. She's the chief of staff now. Oh, ooh, got okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, to reach out to her and say hello, but she was very instrumental too. Yes. Uh, Thank you. She was the first person um, that taught me. I remember calling and I was asking questions and she said, uh, when well, you have a capability statement, and I was like, the heck is that? <laughs> she said, oh, you need a sheet. And, you know, and she reached out and sent me a, a template like, and I still didn't understand it. And I was going, okay, how do I get this? So I just reached out on the internet once on, it was FedBiz then, it was FBO. And um, I reached out on there and a lady in Mechanicsburg said, oh, here, here's mine. This is how you write it. And it was a big help. So not only does your office help in getting that ready, it also connects you with others who have been doing things. So you could actually learn how to do it. And that was a big, big uh, plus for me. That, that writing that capability statement, I was able to not only use that in federal, I mean, not federal, but uh, state and local contracts, but other things, you know, as I went along, it became my, like my calling card. I didn't even use the business card as much as I would hand you a capability statement. Um, if you're going to get into federal and any type of government contracting, local, state, have your eggs, have every egg, all your eggs in the basket, everything ready to go. Have every number that you're supposed to have, have the insurances that are required of you, but have everything ready to go. Because like Bob mentioned earlier, they go over everything. They want to make sure everything is in line, everything is current, and one thing out of place can end up getting you knocked off the list. Be ready to bid. So sitting down, it's going to take time. This is something you have to dedicate yourself to. You're going to have to take an hour or two every other day or a day with a schedule you want, how hungry you are, to start looking for those bids. What do I qualify for? What matches for me? And finding and, and putting in those bids, understanding how to write your bid. Don't be afraid to reach out and find somebody that's a writer. I was terrible as a writer. I had to I looked and I paid people to help me straighten these things out. What paragraph do I need? What's my narrative should look like? You have to do all those things to make sure you're going to be competitive. Other thing I did to get make sure I was in the ball game was I reached out. I called. I would call them. How you doing? I'd ask them questions and try to get a conversation with them. Didn't work at first because they don't know you. You're small. I kept doing it anyway till finally, boom, I hit pay dirt. So finally, when I did, and that's the other thing. When you get a small government contract, it would be state or local, be ready to perform. Um, have all your people in line. Have your, your uh, materials ready to go. Have everything ready to go because they are going to be intrusive. It's going to make you feel a little intrusive. They're going to go into your bank accounts. They're going to make you prove you've been in business for X amount of years. Um, there's a lot of things you're going to make sure your taxes are paid. They're going to look at that. They look at almost everything you can think of that anybody, even to your employees to make sure you're totally clean, ready to do business with them. Um, when I got a, I never forget, I was up for a contract with one airport, Dulles, or Dulles, I don't know how everybody pronounces it. But anyway, I was up for a contract with them to train their Pilots, staff, all of them, and they gave me the requirements. They wanted me to have booklets made for everybody. And I had to ask when they gave me the number of people in the books, I couldn't do the contract because I didn't have a line of credit or enough money to make all those booklets. And everything had to be the same for all these people down at the airport. That was the one thing that canceled me out. So I don't look at it as a defeat. I looked at it as a learning that, okay, if I'm going to bid higher up, I'm going to have to make sure I have enough money. To, to settle, you know, to handle the contracts. Um, that was something that was a little disappointing, I thought for sure, because I mean, I beat out the top runner, but whew, uh, the money was astronomical. Yes, you would get, you're going to get paid. Yes, you'll get money on the back end. Some banks will loan it to you on the front, some won't, you know, depending on your debts, your debt and how you're situated financially. But that was something I was really kind of ticked about that I didn't get. But nonetheless, I did end up getting state contracts. I got a few with different departments in the state, uh, a couple local, but a lot of the state contracts were good. Getting to know the procurement people is important. 
Because if you get on their good side, believe it or not, they talk. They talk to each other. Who did you use? Who did you use? Who did you get done? And before you know it, you're getting another call. So that was really phenomenal there. I got a lot of work that way. People would call me, hey, you send me a bid on this and then I need training for this. Oh, great. And I did a lot of, lot of uh, work that way. So getting in good, making calls, making contacts. I was in every networking group up there. I was in Harrisburg for every networking event they had, I went. Why? I wanted to meet the people who hired you. I wanted to get to know them and get them to know me. So made it a point, go up there, when I don't care if I was dead tired. I was working full time then, third shift. I don't care. I got home, get a shower, get changed, and go to the networking events. I went to any procurement things they had. Even so, and I'll be honest with you, the state hosts the worst. They're boring, repetitive. They don't even know who's there half the time. I win anyway. You sit there, but you got to ask questions. You got to let them, you got to make an impression on them. Don't sit quiet and don't say anything. You got to let them know who you are. Hi, I'm Mark Rhodes. I own Key Learning the Songs. We do diversity training. I mean, I made it a point to be very bold and bashful. And guess what? That being that way got me noticed, got me emails, got me contracts. So like Bob said, there's a there's a need out there for everything. Trust me. I mean, see the cog and that'll drive you crazy <laughs> getting you involved in everything. But the real thing that really used to always impress me was uh, co-stars. Co-stars is really something they used to push with the state. But what I didn't like about it to me, if you look at the small business requirements, man, there was companies I was you could be bidding against like Office Max and <laughs> uh staples and groups like that if you had certain things because they met the small business requirement standard for as employees and they had a better buying power so if you're in it for retail you want to get make sure you have a good wholesaler make sure he's going to have the products you need because you don't want to screw up a contract with them if you get a contract with somebody for supplying them pencils whatever it may be and you can't come through it puts a bad eye on you know so before you know it other groups aren't going to bother with you because that's their job too to make sure those supplies are in place. So you want to make sure that you're a person that can do that. So make sure you have all your eggs in the basket as far as your wholesalers, where you're getting products from, everybody that's it's on point supposed to be on point, getting things ahead of time, being ready to fulfill the contracts is important. I see now, Bob shared, there's a whole lot of different websites. Back when I first got into government contracting, it was like four. <laughs> that was about it. And you, if you dealt with those four, I remember when I got GSA, I had a hard time getting really listed with the GSA. And uh, so what I did is I made a trip. I got in my car and drove to Philadelphia to the GSA office and spoke with this lady. Me and her talked for about two hours. So it was well worth the trip. I got there. We talked about GSA contracting. She taught me a lot. She wanted me to know this is what you got to do. Okay? And it wasn't long after that. I was getting calls and getting some bid opportunities. We had, I built my company up to the point where I had other guys wanting to subcontract with me. That's something else I wanna talk to you about. If you can't take on a whole project, there's nothing wrong with subcontracting. There's nothing wrong with finding somebody to help you. Just make sure you have a non-competitive agreement. Make sure that they, you have all your eggs in the basket before you have them sign on. It's valuable, it's good, and it also spreads the wealth a little bit, but it also makes sure that you get your, you stay front on that. You stay the prime. You're the prime contractor. You take it on and get to know the subcontractors. I had veterans call me. I had a lot of people call me, send me their capability should they statements and all kinds of sheets because we were starting to get on a roll and people were noticing me in the uh, FedBiz op uh, website. So there's nothing wrong with that. So don't be afraid to bid. Don't be afraid to go after those contracts because they're out there. Yes, easy, no. How bad do you want it? You gotta get consistent. Get yourself motivated, get up, get on that computer. I don't care if you fall asleep at it, but start typing in those codes, finding the work that's coming up, um, finding uh, the procurement, get on the phone, don't be afraid to call, so what you get hung up on, so what you, they may not connect you, so what if you got to leave a message, do it anyway. Get out there, make some calls, how you doing, tell them who you are, tell them what you're doing, 
And is there any way you can help me? Is there any way you want to get your name in their mind that when they're looking for what they need, they're thinking about you? And you're competing against a whole lot of people. So you want to get out there. Too many of us now put it in the chat, put, I mean, put it on the website, put the information out, put our bid in and hope they call us. No, get proactive. Get proactive. You're competing against a lot of people. So yeah, you want to get your name out there. You want to get, I got offered a job in Virginia. I didn't get that job in Virginia because I sat around and just put in the bid. I sat around and I made the calls prior to putting in that bid. As soon as I saw they were putting it up on the date due, I started calling. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Asking questions constantly. Do I need this? Do I need that? The one question I forgot to ask was, was there booklets involved? And then when I found out it was, and I couldn't do the booklets and stages. They wanted them all there when it came. It was a mess. But anyway, it was a lesson. It was a lesson. So yeah, you can still do it. As a matter of fact, up till last year, I still was doing some Harrisburg government contract. And now I finally, I had to ease off of them. They could become demanding. Some of them had to, you know, have a lot of needs, but it's worth it. It really is worth it. Call CEDACOG. Get a hold of Bob and his staff. They're experts in this field. You can't do it without them, I'm telling you. I learned so much by calling poor Christian. I know she's probably getting tired of me because I was calling her all the time. I called her after I'd even put in a bid. Christian, I put in this bid at this place that I just, oh, yes, you did. And one thing I, they did too that I don't know uh, if they do anymore, if they used to do a lot of little seminars. Uh, they'd have SBA workshops. Uh, we had them at Hack Campus up there in Harrisburg. They'd have like a couple hours. They'd have people come in and talk about what small business opportunities we were in. I don't know, Bob, if you guys do that anymore, but that used to be something I liked. I think it was once a month they had a speaker come in and we learned about, you know, what to do in your contract, what to look for, how to fill it out, um, SBA registrations. And, you know, the SBA is always changing, always changing. So, that was something beneficial because you'd see something on the website one month and you think you're fine, you got it. And before you know it, they changed that program. A lot of things has happened with political swings. There was always something different coming out of the SBA. So it was really valuable to have those little seminars that you could ask the SBA people directly that, hey, okay, I know last month we had this requirement. Now this month, that's not required anymore. What happened? Oh, yeah, it was a change. But if you don't bring it up and if you don't say anything about it, they're not going to tell you. And that was the one thing that frustrated me was going to a lot of these information sessions and networking sessions and watching everybody sit there real quiet and not ask any questions. To me, if you're sitting there that quiet, you're not, you're not involved. You got to get aggressive. You're competing against a lot of people but have your eggs in the basket. Because I've been in, I've been at seminars where people had all kinds of really nice businesses. I thought, wow, that's a really good business. I'll do this. But they weren't incorporated, didn't have insurance, didn't have an EIN number, didn't have anything. And I was thinking, how did you even get here? Well, there's no hold on information. They make sure you have the information, but you, <laughs> you got to make sure you're right. So and that was nice with Bob's office. Christian would grill you. She say, "Do you have this? Do you have that?" You know, and she wasn't grilling you to be. Um, she wasn't grilling you to be negative, so to speak. She was grilling you to make sure you were ready for what you had to be get ready for, and I like that. She would make sure do you have this number, and she would go as far as to say, "Here's where you get that number. Here's how you get this in. When you get to this section, you get stuck. Call me because we didn't have the Zoom and all those things back then." Back then, you had to, the phone was your big lifeline. You had to make sure. So all I can say is if you're going to go after government contracts, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Use the resources that are available to you. Don't be afraid to call on Bob's office. Don't be afraid to ask the questions you need to ask and look at yourself in the tightest of things because a lot of times they go back three years and do your bank accounts. A lot of people don't like giving that information out. Government contract, a lot of times it's required. Uh, state, not so much, but I know in other uh, agencies, they definitely want to make sure that you're in business, you have an account in your business name. Uh, there's a lot of those things that, that slip us up. 
And then oftentimes when we decide to do it, then you want to open up an account in your business name. You may be too late. You need me to have to have two or three years track record. Be ready to print out. Sometimes they want three years of um, account information to make sure you're on the up and up, whatever it may be. But if you're getting involved or you already are, have your have everything straight. Make sure you, you want to make yourself no proof. You don't want them to eliminate you or say no to you simply because you don't have a simple thing, you know, something that you could easily get. So let's make sure that's done. So with that, I'm finished. <laughs> All right, there we go. Thanks, Mark. And thank you, Robert, for sharing your knowledge and your information and your experiences as well. Very helpful to our audience. Um, I see that we have some questions coming in here. So we have a few a few moments to answer some questions. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sully Pinos, Executive Director of the Bloom, Empa the Bloom Business Empowerment Center. And she'll be doing some Q&A with Mark and Robert. So go ahead, Sully. Awesome. Thanks, Hannah. Um, Mark and Robert, if you could turn on your cameras, it'd be great to just keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. So many great uh, tips and information. And I think overarching message, there are resources out there to help our small business community, uh, certainly resources that are available at no cost, um, but with great impact. So we really hope that all of you watching this morning are taking that as uh, as a message. And um, Robert, hope, uh, hope you and the team have your inboxes ready because I can see all the questions coming in to answer, um, uh, to provide help to the small businesses. So um, also wanted to mention before we dive in, uh, Mark, you had talked about networking opportunities and how you went to all of them and the procurement fairs. And I wanted to, uh, to add that tomorrow night, um, as part of the inaugural Minority Enterprise Development Week here in York County, we are hosting a Bloom Small Business Mixer uh, and graduation for individuals that have gone through the Bloom educational training, um, but a, a, a networking mixer. Uh, nonetheless, we'll have about 100 small business owners all connecting with resources, larger companies. Um, so really can't emphasize enough um, the, the opportunity to come in. Um, this event is no cost and hope that you're able to join us. And I'm adding that into the chat for everyone joining and we can send it out to, uh, we can also send it out to all of our attendees today in the follow-up. But jumping right in, I know there's a, question, a few questions in the chat. So uh, Mark, uh, for you, what would you say are some of the, the benefits that you have seen or uh, recommendations for individuals that are looking to become a minority registered enterprise or women uh, registered enterprise? I think now it's better than it was. Uh, for years, I was a listed uh, certification for the state. Um, and the first year or two, I really didn't get anything out of it. And I had to get aggressive about it. that's when someone says to me, it's just not going to come to you. You got to go out and get it. So that was a strong learning for me. And it, I, I did want to say this about your networking events. When people think certain people aren't there, you don't know who people know. So it's always good to go and let them know what you do, because they may have a friend or relatives that may need your service. So you should always get involved. Go to the networkings. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll, we'll see you there and, and many of you on today's call. Um, Bob, um, do you no, want to add anything? Oh, sorry. I noticed, I noticed that, um, you know, Kim Stout from SBA uh, mentioned about the doing business with the government mm -hmm. and federal government certifications they do monthly. That is very good. Um, and um, anything on the education end of things, learn it. The more you learn about all of this, the better. And the SBA is a great resource. Uh, so, um, and also I wanted to mention, if you sign up for our program, we have access to a training uh, interface. You will have access to it for free called Govology, and it is really geared toward federal government contracting. So we have, uh, you know, uh, many times there are attorneys that are, that are the, the speakers. It's on-demand webinars on various topics related to federal government contracting. It's really more in the federal government arena not really in the state or local government, but I just wanted to mention it, signing up for our program, you'll get access to Govology for free and you can access those trainings anytime, so. 
Well, we'll make sure to send that out and certainly it'd be great. We'll push it out through our downtown Inc. and our Bloom newsletters to all of the small businesses. Um, so Bob, this might be a great follow-up. So after this call, what's the number one thing or the biggest priority that you would encourage the participants joining us and those watching after um, on YouTube? What would you encourage them to do if they are interested, um, if they are interested in um, pursuing this certification? You're asking me? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, that link on my slide presentation to sign up for our program. Uh, you would want to do that. Complete the client enrollment form online. It's just, uh, I think it's also important to have a company website if you have a business. Um, I highly recommend that, you know, you would include that in your application. Um, that's just all part of your marketing, you know, that you're going to do when Mark was talking about you know, networking, I, Mark hit the nail right on the head there, networking, getting to know the players, getting to know the people. Uh, you know, we're living in an age now where we're all using Zoom and things like that, and that's all great. But it's always better to have person-to-person, face-to-face contact when you can put a name with the face. Um, you know, Zoom meetings are, are absolutely the, the way to go, um, but also in person is really, really a very good way to go to get to know somebody that really ask the questions and so forth, but networking, Mark was mentioning it, it's so important. It's the most overlooked aspect of government contracting. Um, so, but yeah, I, so the answer to your question, complete the client enrollment form. When you get that application, we'll have a look at, at it and see, okay, where are you at now? Have you completed your federal uh, vendor registration? Have you completed your state? Like Mark said, we'll help you put a capability statement together set you up on our automated bid notice program, uh, which you'll get to use for free for about six months. And then we, we, that's one thing we do have a small fee for, $75 every six months for the bid matching program. Some PTAC programs, depending on where you're located, don't charge for it. We charge a small fee, uh, but we're also pretty flexible on that too. So, but we wanna help you find open bids and that bid match program will help you, so. All right. So you heard it here. After this call, if you are interested, go fill out the client enrollment form. Yeah, we'll include the link and the presentation from today's session. Um, and Bob, as you mentioned about capability statements, Mark, this question's for you. Um, what would you say, what's the difference between a capability statement and what business, it, business owners might know referred to as a business plan? A business plan is more detailed. It goes into the financial structure of how you want to make your business run and how your business should be running. That's really, to me, business plans are always for you, the business owner. Your capability statement shouldn't be no more than one page. One page. One page. That's something Christian taught me. She said, don't write a book. Don't write three, four pages. They just want to know the meat real fast because they don't, they're going to get a lot of information. So your capability statement simply says who you are, what you're capable of doing, and what you offer. Okay. And you're saying to use really small fonts so you can get it all in one page. Nope. Right? Don't use small fonts. You <laughs> use the font that they can read. <laughs> and, and don't be overwhelming with it because it really does make a difference. It does. Even when you're meeting them and, and you're doing, I always used to carry mine with me, and you okay. hand it to them. There, a lot of times they'll peruse it and read while they're standing there talking to you. So you want to make it really really quick and easy. Maybe use the 12, you know, font. They can make it readable but just don't go over. You want to leave them wanting to ask you more questions. Sure. And I think you took my next question. Is that something that for any of these networking events or procurement uh, information sessions, if a business owner is interested, should they bring that capability sheet with them? I did. <laughs> All right. Uh, absolutely, you should. Yeah. And matter of fact, the other thing I wanted to point out when the federal government um, is looking for Remember, I said you use, they have a sources sought process, you know, where they're kind of looking for businesses that might respond to an opportunity that they're hopefully going to be putting out in the future. Many times they have in there include your capability statement, statement with your response. So we teach our clients develop your capability statement right up front, just like Kristen taught Mark. Um, and you use it at trade shows to answer your question. You can post it on, a, on your company website under a link called government. Um, you use it for direct mailing, uh, you know, anything, any kind of event uh, that you're going to, your capability statement is very important. It shows that you've done your, your homework. We call it your elevator speech on paper. So if you have two minutes to tell somebody about your business, that's what's on your capability statement. I want to emphasize, 
past performance is, is very important in government contracting. And, and if you don't have government contracts that you've already obtained, put commercial past performance on there. It's very important to demonstrate, hey, I'm a viable business. I'm in business. I have customers. That goes a long way. Uh, you know, when you when you uh, or at least who you know who's your past performance? Who who are you doing business with? Can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so it's it's really like here's your resume, here's your experience, here's who you are. Um, and in our small business classes, this you know the pitch that you mentioned, that's what we end our classes with having an opportunity, like what's your elevator sp speech? What are you taking away? How is, you know, tell, tell us about your business to someone completely new. So um, hopefully tomorrow, if you're watching this, you can practice your pitch um, at the Bloom Small Business Mixer and Graduation event um, and bring business cards and, and make sure to connect with other um, entrepreneurs and resources. So. Yeah, so the other thing, when you guys put out your capability statement, like you, like Bob just said, and you put your commercial contracts, if you haven't had a government, don't put all of them. You know what I mean? You don't make a list this long that they're sitting there reading for five minutes, all these different, just put your latest ones on that they could see that you are, that you're capable, the latest five or 10 or so that you, you know, but don't make a whole list. I've seen just talking to a, I was just dealing with a client this week, <clears throat> talking about networking. One of the clients I've been working with for a long time, uh, he is he's a really good salesman, and I know Mark is too. Um, but one of the things that really impresses me with him is he he would go to pre bid meetings um, and network and meet people. And I, I swear, he is such a the guy was such a good salesman. He would have the agencies calling him. He sell, sells heavy equipment, um, and he would have the agencies calling him wanting his product so bad. That's how good of a salesman he was. He would actually get to the program managers, get to the end users at the government, and they would actually call him and say, we want to buy this from you. How can we, you know, we, you know, make sure you're registered in Sam, make sure you get all this stuff done. He got a contract this week. It wasn't a big contract. It was a $20,000 contract because of, his, his the way he conducts himself going out meeting people and it's at the 9-11 uh, memorial out in western pennsylvania they had an emergency procurement they had a windstorm trees got knocked down uh on the fence out there and so that's a national park service and he got that contract because he he knew people in the government and they thought of him when that when that pride when that happened they thought of him and he's he's got the contract you know, and it was an emergency procurement. It's to remove the trees that fell down. It's also to um, replace the fencing, you know, that needs that needs replaced at the at the 9/11 memorial in Western Pennsylvania. So it's also you know a place where he's like, uh, it's really an honor to even be there doing that work. You know, um, so it's just a neat experience. It's it's uh, and you can do it. Like Mark said, you can do it. You got to commit to this long term have a long-term approach to it and, and learn, just keep learning and, and you will get a contract. Absolutely. Well, on that, on that note, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mark, for uh, navigating this Q and A with us. I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but we'll get the questions to you. Maybe you can give us some answers and we can send it out to the attendees. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Hannah to close out the program. All right. Thanks everybody. So just a few quick um, announcements before we wrap here. Um, and first, let me say thank you to our attendees and thank you so much, Robert, Mark, and Sully for joining us. Um, and thank you to PNC for sponsoring this event. So first up, um, our fall downtown update was held earlier this month on the 5th at the Appel Center. If you missed it, we will drop the video replay in the chat here. So up on our website, the fall sweetest the fall 2022 Sweetest Pine Tasting Tour will be held next Saturday, the 29th throughout downtown York. This is a beer tasting and food pairing event. Lots of fun throughout downtown York at different businesses. There's still a few tickets left. So we encourage you to help us spread the word and come on down to downtown York for this event. And lastly, the down, last week, Downtown Inc. welcomed our newest team member, Corey Wolf. Corey will be the urban revitalization manager working on a lot of clean and green activities, historic preservation, wayfinding, pedestrian 
and bike improvements, public safety, art installation and management, and so much more. So we'll drop a blog that we did here um, for you to read more about Corey. So again, thank you for everybody to, for joining us this morning. Please join us on November 16th for our next business series. It will be, um, we'll learn about inspiring storefronts and this event will be over lunch from 12 to 1 p.m. The registration link is coming at you now. All right, everybody, that wraps up for today. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll hopefully see you next month.